everybody. Uh, I'm Elisaveta, and uh, I work as a data scientist at Vault. Um, Nessa asked me to come here and to share my experience of working, working at startup. So Vault it's, uh, is already like six years old. Uh, you might think that okay, it's, it already has a lot of history, uh, but in reality it's still a, like a startup. It has a startup mode. And uh, I work at Vault for one year and a half now, and I'm like, still confused that we are like a startup. We are moving fast, uh, we are growing fast, we develop new products. So I have like something to share with you today. Uh, so you're a bachelor student of third year, right? Yeah. Uh, and you study entrepreneurship? Startup. Startup. Start Start okay, yeah. All of you? Yeah. Okay, right. And uh, also, if I understand, you have some projects which you work on. Yeah. And uh, you participated in Starter Tallinn. Yeah. yeah, we yeah. launched in 2017 with uh -huh. our different project, but right now we are working on something different. Oh, okay. So, like, uh, in the end, uh, we will have a time so we can discuss your project okay. and I can give you some help and feedback. Yes. Yes. Uh, but now, uh, let's move on and. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, today, uh, first, I will start with my background. Uh, um, how I became a data scientist. Uh, then I talk uh, briefly about Bolt, uh, uh, what Bolt was like six years ago and, and uh, uh, what Bolt is now. Uh, my part uh, of my today presentation will be about like startup experience and uh, he, these are three main uh, like most important characteristics which I like, learned uh, working at Bolt. We will talk about data driven culture, about how to be efficient and about like how to be um, proactive, because I think these are the main component which can like help you and to uh, lead to your success uh, with your projects or you when you will work in like startup or any other company. And if you have any question, just uh, ask right away. So my goal here is not to go through all slides, but share my knowledge and share my experience. Uh, and let's start. Um, so, actually, I came from finance background. Uh, I finished my bachelor uh, in Russia and I graduated from uh, Moscow State University of Economic Statistics and Informatics. How you can see from the name, uh, it was like mathematics and statistics heavy program. Uh, and uh, you know, mathematics was my third subject and all I created to mathematics courses uh, as well. I, like, uh, I love mathematics. I really enjoyed like, solving differential equations, integrals, uh, uh, calculus, uh, and that's why I participated in many uh, student competitions in mathematics and statistics. And uh, yeah, I was a winner of many of them. And this experience of participating in mathematics uh, gave a good uh, background for me and uh, gave a boost to, like, uh, later on to enter the data science field. Uh, I was interested in mathematics and statistics, that's why after when I graduated, I decided that I wanted that my job will be connected to this field. And this is how I started to work as a business analyst uh, at a leading construction company in Russia. In reality, this uh, work was like a combination of data analytics and business analytics. So as a business analyst, I was uh, responsible for building e-commerce platform for a company. And as a data analyst, I was uh, uh, responsible for uh, building dashboards, building business intelligence tools for a company, uh, and uh, also like uh, helping managers with, with analysis of departments, analysis of sales, to say why uh, answering questions why product decreases like in sales or why revenue for other product increase. After working for two years as a business analyst, I decided to continue my education on master level. And I was looking for a program which would be based on economics, but also which would be mathematic uh, heavy. And this is how I found the quantitative economics program in Tartu. Um, I really enjoyed this program because uh, like the program which like, is um, for this uh, uh, master is really like a mi good mix of economics, mathematics, statistics, and programming. During my first semester of a master, uh, I started to learn programming and we learned the Python. 
Uh, and uh, that's how I got into coding. And I'm really glad that I started this Python because uh, probably you heard about this programming language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you probably also know that it's like very simple and easy to learn and uh, go, uh, uh, get into this program. And uh, yeah, for me it was uh, kind of easy to start learning it. So, yeah, sure. Come in. Uh, so, and for me it was easy to start learning and just I started to practice more and more. Uh, and uh, now I had these two passions, mathematics and programming. And during one of uh, our seminars, uh, the topic was about machine learning. And actually right there I realized that uh, coding, and programming and mathematics, it's like uh, what uh, consists, like machine learning consists of. So, and it's like, it was my two patients, and I started to learn more about machine learning. Uh, I read some blog posts, I started to take additional courses, like on poster at the university as well. Uh, I practiced my skills, uh, and uh, at some point of time I realized that like building models, uh, uh, building different algorithms, uh, doing power parameters, it's like a hobby for me. And I can do it without like noticing even time. And uh, uh, at this point, I came to the conclusion that, okay, machine learning and more broader data science is a field uh, which like, motivates me, which drives me to like, which uh, like, I'm passionate about and I wanted to work as a data scientist after my graduation. So yeah, um, that's like uh, how I went to data science, uh, but why both? So, um, I didn't want uh, to work at some like corporate like, company, which would uh, have a lot of which would have a lot of rules, a lot of so-called like company corporate bullshit or something. And uh, it's because like uh, I'm I like, like freedom. I like uh, like the creative atmosphere, and I think it relates uh, that I participated a lot in hackathons. So I started to participate in hackathons like when I. I started my master, and during two years, uh, I participated in more than 10 hackathons. So you are aware of what hackathons are. And uh, who of you participated in any hackathon? Yeah, okay, which hackathons uh, did you participate in? Oh, for the, uh, last year, it's 2018. Uh, I, I just did uh, one day. Ah, okay, but still one day, <laughs> it's also a like, good experience to feel what it is. Yeah. And what I like about hackathons is that during this short period of time, you should like uh, focus a lot, you should concentrate, and uh, you should build a prototype and like working prototype, and then you should like pitch your idea and show that what you are building it like uh, it makes sense and it makes sense like to develop it further. Um, yeah, that's like. Uh, uh, but, uh, now also I have like such a like, big experience with hackathons. I'm not only participating in them, but I also uh, mentoring at some of them, like at some Garage 48 hackathons and also different uh, other startup competitions. Like just uh, last week, uh, I was in a jury for Goldfish Tank. It's a kind of a final presentation of projects uh, by uh, uh, high school students. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really fascinated that like, now there are so many opportunities for people to like try to build a project, build the idea, and uh, all this started even like, from high school. So I'm really glad that there are so many like opportunities for that. Uh, so yeah, and, uh, as, uh, I liked uh, like this start of mood. I decided okay, boat is a really good place to work in, and especially it's a really good place to work uh, as a data scientist. Uh, yeah, that's like all about my background, and now uh, let's talk about Bolt. So, probably all of you know what Bolt is. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because like it's very popular in Italian. But maybe not of you know that Bolt is the fastest growing right handed company in the world. So, there are like many competitors, but uh, like Uber, Lyft, Grab, and so on, but uh, Bolt is the fastest among all of them. And yeah, you can see like that during the past uh, years, uh, both grew tremendously, and we grew about uh, twenty percent uh, each month. And now we have like more than twenty-five million users across the globe. And uh, we operate 
in many, many, in more than 30 countries, like from Mexico to Australia. Uh, our main markets are Europe and Africa, and there, both is number one or number two player on the right hand market. So, like, uh, probably you didn't know that. Actually, like, both it's not on the cards, but also, like, like when you open up in Tallinn, you see, like, main category, basic, green, and something. But in some countries in Africa, you can also order a motorbike, uh, or how they call it in Africa, boda boda. So basically, not car will arrive to you, but some motorbike, and you'll sit with driver, and he'll give you a helmet, and uh, you'll drive. Yeah, yeah. So it's very cool, and especially it's very convenient in uh, high populated African cities. Yeah, yeah because like uh, traffic uh, is can be uh, very intense sometimes, and using motorbikes you move faster, and it's cheaper as well. Uh, yeah, but also probably you know about gold scooters. You saw them on uh, Tallinn streets this summer. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, our second product uh, after right hand. Uh, actually, we started uh, with scooters more than one year ago in Paris. So first we launched it not in Baltics but in France, uh, and only this summer we launched it in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, yeah, and uh, we were surprised that actually, like, utilization rate for scooters was very, like, really high, and in Baltics, vandalism rates were much lower than in France, for example, and we, like, we were very, like, wet about this fact. Uh, and also, Bolt was the first uh, app which introduced the uh, both, like, cars and scooters in the same app. So yeah, obviously there exists like Lime and Bird, but it was separate app. And Bolt was the first who like mixed all these two uh, way of uh, mobility, uh, overall mobility uh, in one app. But uh, you, know, it's not all. We grow and we develop new products, and yeah, now we have all also food delivery. Uh, we uh, started with uh, food delivery in Tallinn in August. Uh, yeah, and now we also operate in Vilnius. From last week, we started in Tartu as well, and we are going to continue to expand and expand more uh, in Baltics and in South Africa. Um, why uh, we built and scooters and food delivery during a like, short period of time, and why we did it because uh, uh, we uh, uh, collect like a huge experience from right hand and uh, we like have our infrastructure we know like how to operate and we just transfer this experience to new products and it what allows us to stay efficient it what allows us uh, to keep cost low to like uh, give uh, lower prices for users and higher earnings for drivers or uh, couriers uh, yeah that's uh, about bolt but yeah, uh, you can like, think that Bolt currently became a very big company, and uh, when company becomes like a kind of a relatively big, you should think not only about revenue, about profit, but also, uh, also about what impact on uh, other, what, on the world, on the environment uh, it makes. So I'm really proud that currently like Bolt has a green plan, and it means that all Bolt rides in Europe are now 100% like, efficient. Uh, carbon carbon neutral. Uh, it means that uh, we calculated what CO2 uh, emission produced by all rights in Europe and then we offset this uh, uh, CO2 emission and invest this money into some green projects. So basically we care about the environment, we want that uh, uh, CO2 produced by our rights will be offset and uh, also by this action we want to uh, motivate other players in market uh, to do the same and it really works <laughs> like because uh, recently uh, Walt uh, yeah he uh, th they also announced about their green plan initiative about offsetting uh, deliveries so like this initiative really works uh, it's like about external part of Walt uh, what it is but why uh, why uh, it is like so successful. What is the like, key of uh, uh, success? I think uh, it uh, comes from uh, culture, which uh, uh, there exists in both. 
and uh, our internal culture is based on these three main values fearless, smart, and responsible. Um, so, what it means? Uh, we believe that uh, we need to move fast, we need to be at the same way like, level as our big competitors, like Uber, for example. And we believe that to move fast, we need, uh, people will need freedom. And uh, freedom only works with uh, great people. So it's about like this smart uh, weather. Uh, also, smart. What means uh, to be smart? It means that we uh, make decisions based on data, not on ego or opinion. So if you show, uh, if you can prove these numbers that what you're proposing like makes sense, then uh, everybody will like trust you uh, because it's based on real facts. Uh, next value for us is that we have a passion over uh, experience. So it doesn't matter like, how many years uh, some person had like, with something. We believe that if a person is passionate about something, he will learn what is needed to be learned and then uh, uh, we will just drive uh, a company uh, further. And uh, last but not least, that we value our mistakes uh, over not trying. Uh, it means that uh, to move fast, we need to iterate fast. It means that we need, should uh, like try different features for products, and uh, we are not uh, afraid to do mistakes uh, because uh, if you will not try, it will be just missed opportunities. Uh, I will share a link for site uh, in the end, so that you can take picture now if you want. Uh, and yeah, like based on this uh, value as. Uh, there are the main, uh, in my opinion, most important feature, uh, like not feature, but like points which you, you can apply to your projects or like in any company which you will work in later. And they are data-driven culture, efficiency, and productivity. And uh, now let's discuss uh, one by one uh, each of these. Let's start. Uh, with uh, data driven culture. Um, have you heard about uh, this term before? Have you met it somewhere? Uh, okay, and uh, to explain what it is, let's consider some example. So imagine some company X. Uh, and this, uh, imagine also that this company has a huge department of analytics where 50 analysts work. Um, also, imagine that this company has a like, big CRM system. CRM stands for, for Customer Relationship Management System. Also, there are like, two really expensive BI tools, like, business intelligence tools, where like, main, main KPI, KPI of company uh, collected. And also, every day, each employee receives email with five uh, dashboards of main company metrics. So how do you think? Uh, is this company data driven? Just like if you don't know what it is, like just based on your intuition. So, who thinks that the uh, company is data driven? Uh, so, who thinks it's not a data driven company? Mostly data driven. Uh, sorry? It's mostly data driven, most uh, for example. Uh, okay, we see that this company has a lot of data. But. Uh, uh -huh. So, yeah, this company has a lot of data, but uh, being data driven, it doesn't mean that you should only have data. Being data driven means that you will use this data for some, having some insight, making forecasts, and so on. So, like, if a uh, company just have data and just like looking at it without making any decisions based on data, data, it means there are no data driven culture in the company. So if we know that uh, data is just exists but not used, it's like not uh, about being data driven. Because in, in data driven culture, data is used for developing strategic insights, for investigating trends, for predicting outcomes or discovering new patterns. So basically, if you have data about your sales, you will use it to make some forecast uh, what will be sales in next month, ne next year. Uh, if you know data about your users, you will try to find any patterns in user behavior 
and try to understand why some users churn, why other users retain. So is it clear now? Okay, good. Now let's, uh, uh, yeah, and if you have like this data, you like use it, not only like look at it, then it will like give you a lot of benefits. Um, yeah, and uh, some more like uh, characteristics of data-driven culture. Uh, it's uh, it's better to build data-driven culture in your team, in your project, or in, like in organization if it starts uh, with the leader. So if the leader is data-driven, then he will like show by his example uh, what it, it is to be data-driven and uh, will spread this uh, culture across the whole team, the whole like, organization. Uh, also, like uh, if a uh, leader is data driven, he will show like some examples and always will prove it with data. And like by, by this storytelling, he will show to others how like this uh, uh, some stories should be presented, and uh, it will be easier for other people to learn. Uh, also, data driven culture means that there are no uh, decisions are based on data and not on hippo. Uh, did anybody hear about HIPAA effect? No? Yeah. So HIPAA, it stands for highest paid person opinion. So like, probably you like heard about some situation when like somebody who has like higher salary, it will be the most important person and uh, all decisions will be uh, made by, by him or her. And in data-driven culture, there are no like such hippo effect, because all decisions are based not on experience, not on like um, experience of person, but on uh, data, not on intuition, but on some real facts. Um, yeah. Uh, let's uh, go next. Um, uh, also, when uh, there is data-driven data leader, uh, like. The whole like all team members will also become data driven, and uh, it means also that uh, uh, there should be easy way to communicate and to share knowledge within team, project, or uh, company. So there 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 is no uh, there are no any barriers like for information to flow. Uh, let's say if you have like a project uh, with your teammates, and uh, then you collect information, you can easily share it with others. And uh, they will like easily access what uh, your findings, and they easily understand uh, what you did. Mm. Uh, third point, uh, it's about uh, that data in the data driven culture is embedded uh, into the culture itself, and data is everywhere. Uh, also, it means uh, it relates to storytelling. So storytelling is like art of presenting the results of your work. Uh, so let's say uh, you do, you have a project and uh, you did a research uh, on your competitors. You present it to your teammates and you show some graph. If you spend five minutes uh, to explain others what it is on this graph, probably something went wrong because others cannot easily understand and uh, your graph is like it's not a uh, very good example of storytelling. Uh, storytelling is really a useful skill, it does not relate only to startup, it's actually a useful skill to have in life in general. So if you uh, would like to learn more about this, I really suggest the book Storytelling with Data by Cole Nussbaum and Knafik. Uh, it's a very practical guide uh, to this field, uh, and uh, I really like how uh, she uh, Mm, provide with examples how from just plot make a visualization which will tell a story. So I really suggest you to check out this book uh, and invest uh, your time uh, just maybe a couple of days to read it. Um, last uh, but not least, that yeah, data is uh, everywhere in data driven culture, but data is not everything. You should also look ar around and uh, to like uh, go outside uh, of your office and uh, talk to just uh, your customers on just like to look at how your competitors actually operate 
which cannot be reflected in some numbers. Um, I like this uh, quote by Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, that um, if you wait when you will have 90% of all available information, then probably your uh, your being slow. Uh, coming back to this example of uh, making research of your competitor, so obviously you can collect information uh, of all competitors which you have, but it can take a long period of time, let's say like three months or something. Instead of spending three months, you can just uh, spend maybe a short period of time, a couple of weeks, but collect information only about main competitors or competitors from different like areas which will reflect the whole picture. So you should not like strive for 100% of all available information, just uh, uh, see what is reasonable amount to make decision on. Uh, yeah, so we've talked about data driven culture, and now let's uh, move on to the next point uh, efficiency. Uh, at both, uh, efficiency like, is a very important topic because um, also you can think that okay, now there are more than 1,000 people, employees working at both, uh, but still we are much smaller than our competitors. Like, Engineer team at Volt, it, like only engineers, like software engineers, data scientists, it's about 200 people. But just compare with Uber. In Uber, engineering department is more than 3,000 employees. Mm. So you can compare like 200 and 3,000 people. Mm. Uh, yeah, and their view is actually the same product. And like for us, being efficient, efficient, it means that, okay, with this small teams, we can achieve the same results as our competitors with much bigger teams. And how we can do this? Uh, the main our principle is to use Pareto principle. So it's very common. And now, uh, are you uh, do you know about Pareto principle? Uh, so basically, Pareto principle it means that uh, twenty percent of your effort will give you eighty percent of results. So basically, it doesn't matter like how hard you work, like only twenty percent of your time uh, will give you like eighty percent of uh, final outcome. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, for us, it means that we always uh, like uh, prioritize what we should work on. So we see, okay, there is this item in our uh, item in our pack of. We see like how much we need to spend on that, and also we um, uh, confront it versus like how much impact we are going to have with this new feature. Let's say. So and if we see that we need to spend several weeks to do it but effect you will just like 100% increase in some metric we will just postpone this task but if we see that even with some small improvement we can achieve a fairly big impact then we will prioritize it and do it first uh, yeah and, uh, uh, and another good quote which I like uh, about uh, from Adrian Hoffman uh, from LinkedIn that if you are not embarrassed by first version of your product, you won't do it. So like, if you have some project, you should not spend time at first like be building the most beautiful landing page with the most beautiful what you, you should focus on so you can have some basic like landing page and then uh, you can just uh, talk to your customers what they want, uh, discover their like, potential needs and only after like you have your first leads you can start like putting engineering effort into improving your product. Uh, uh, also about efficiency, uh, be, being efficient it means that uh, you should replicate where uh, possible in a way very necessary. Um, so if you start to do something, just investigate maybe uh, these approaches, these methods all already exist, and you will not uh, need to invent invent your own view. Uh, once again about this like competitor research thing. Probably you, know, you can just Google like what are your competitors and maybe you can find some already ready research about this field and you can just extract some like points which are relevant to you. So you don't need to collect this information by yourself, just uh, make uh, some research and find already ready uh, research and solution. Uh, what else uh, can help to be efficient? It's a, a task 
uh, task combo, uh, time boxing and fast base lines. It was uh, it is what I already mentioned about like building some first uh, simple baseline version and uh, uh, improving it only after you have some leads and uh, potential clients. Uh, task bo time boxing uh, it means that um, you when you like start working on this baseline you define what period of time it will require you estimate something you work during this period of time and after that okay you you see if this prototype is completed or not and uh, uh, should you prolong this period or not but uh, you should not just like sit and work it without any time boxing uh, otherwise you can just like always uh, uh, improve some feature and uh, even don't um, see it, that maybe this feature is not needed at all. Um, a good example of the uh, mm -hmm. point is that uh, how we launched the scooters and the boat food. So as for scooters, we, uh, like the version of uh, like first product, which uh, when we started working, it was built during just two months. So like teams just like spent about only like two months uh, and then uh, this product already was and they were first scooter right made. Uh, after the period of day, like some users tell us, okay, something is not working and they will really fix bugs, uh, fix, uh, did some additional feature. But during the short period of time, we delivered product, we shipped it, and then we started to like improve it. And uh, yeah, it's similar story with uh, was with uh, both food. Uh, so. We talked about data agriculture, we talked about efficiency, and now about proactivity. Uh, Wikipedia defines uh, proactivity as uh, taking control and making things happen, rather than just adjusting to a situation or waiting for something to happen. So basically, proactivity means that uh, uh, you just you don't sit and wait, then somebody will tell you what to do. Uh, proactivity means that. Uh, idea come uh, ideas uh, comes from you, and it's you who decide what to do next. It's you who like brainstorm and uh, suggest uh, like uh, what can be done in the project. Um, so like uh, in both, uh, it doesn't matter like what is your position, uh, your data scientist or your engineer or your like, customer support specialist. Uh, it's always expected that you will be proactive and. Uh, uh, even if you give given some just fuzzy requirements what to do, you will figure it out by yourself. You will come up with a plan, you will come up with the details, uh, what should be done with them, you will propose your own solutions. And uh, that's what I would like to advise to you. If you have your own project, uh, it's not only team lead who should decide what should be done. Each team member should think uh, like what we can do, uh, what uh, we can do to improve our product, uh, uh, who we need to contact to, uh, like, to get some feedback, some advice, and so on. Also, proactivity means that uh, uh, you should not be afraid to like do mistakes because mistakes are learnings and not trying are uh, missed opportunities. Uh, for us, at both it means that uh, we do a lot of uh, experiments. So let's say we add new features to our app, uh, we change in design. And it's like a, a doing experiments kind of A-B test. So we, okay, we introduce a feature and then we measure what is the effect of what you've done. If number of users increase or not, or like is the um, number of orders made increase or not. And all our decisions based are on some metrics because if we change something and if we see that this new design increase metric, then we will introduce it. If not, okay, we will go out of there. Uh, so, uh, this main point, efficiency, uh, data green culture, efficiency, proactivity, uh, what we just discussed. And now just uh, think for a moment, uh, what are main uh, learnings which you uh, like uh, get from my presentations? Just think like for one minute, what you uh, like you get from the slides. So 
So everybody can at least say some uh, one thing. Yeah, and uh, if you want, yeah. you can share with us because I'm like, uh, it's usually the place. Everybody has uh, his own view yeah. on things, okay. and uh, your uh, point of view can be different. And it will be good if you will share with others. So if uh, anybody yeah, wants can, to share, yeah. so it will be very nice. So is it about your presentation or the company itself? Uh, I mean, uh, did you learn something new which you can apply to your project or if like, you can apply it like, to your work, let's say? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have some idea that is, well, mm -hmm. we speak is a learning point and uh, also you may find that I, I got it from you that uh, everybody has the right to talk freedomly mm -hmm. and share their idea yeah. because it's worth in, in a good team work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I usually focus on your data driven approach, sir. Uh -huh. Because uh, as I can understood in a startup company, data is very important. Because yes. this is very easy to get decision. Uh -huh. Because uh, as you said that uh, if you are giving a presentation, uh -huh. maybe some of them can understand you. Uh -huh. But uh, if you have the good number yeah. or the same data. People can understand these things. Like you need this app, uh, one million people, or the, I mean, ten thousand customers. Mm -hmm. This is easily I mean, understandable. So mm -hmm. people can also think: Do I need to take this decision or not? Yeah. So, so I think yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a very important point when you like present some idea. Yeah. You like uh, prove it with some numbers. So and the other people like you believe you, and it's not based yeah. on some just opinions. And also your data. When you can start something, you don't need to take time to think about this. At least try and get the key. Yeah, sure. Like uh, here is a link for slides, actually. Yeah. So you can like go there and download and like come back to the slides later on, like digest all this information, <laughs> come back later again. Yeah. It's interesting. Okay. Uh, Anybody else wants to share? Actually, I have a question. Oh. Yeah, sure. Like, if you have any questions, yeah, sure, we can now answer it. Yeah, sorry. They, they are waiting for me to ask. Yes. That's all. So, so um, you mentioned a couple of things, but um, I was just thinking, uh, you told us to read if we can, some book on storytelling. Uh -huh. But you didn't say how we actually tell the stories or how do we do it, like practically. How do you create it in your company? Because this is more, it should be more like, um, like practice dr driven or maybe like example driven so that we can know what to point out to in future. For example, you talked about data driven. You said a lot of things, it's quite an understanding. But most of the times it's easier to listen and it's understanding like this in class. Mm -hmm. Or maybe by the time you get back home and you're trying to mm -hmm. like work on it, then it becomes hard. So how exactly do you use this data or get this data? Or what kind of data are you talking about? How, what do you mean by efficiency? Mm -hmm. How do you like make use of it practically? Mm -hmm. Are they softwares? Are they certain form of analysis? How do you become like do proactivity, whatever? Mm -hmm. But first question. That's just general question. But the first question is like, how do we do the storytelling thing? Yeah. Uh, so um, in this book, there are a lot of like particular situations, and author give like which kind of visualization you can apply to tell a story with data. Uh, I can give uh, one example. So let's say like there is some team, and they uh, uh, they want to ask uh, about additional employees to add to this team, and uh, basically you can just show and there like author suggest okay showing number of incoming tickets and number of sold tickets. And uh, it shows over time this, this difference increase. So like number of tickets, you know, like it was customer support department or something mm -hmm. increase, but number resolved issues decrease. So basically this chart will show to you how like many more like, tickets are not resolved from time to time. And basically this chart will show that, okay, more employees are needed. And this like this visualization, it's possible to prove that okay, uh, we need to more people in your team. Mm -hmm. Is it understandable? And that uh, and that goes for uh, is it data driven or efficiency uh, or something. This example was about storytelling, so, so I, it's just like from this book. 
And if you want like more examples, you can just like, uh, there are many of them, like uh, dozens different examples of uh, uh, storytelling and visualization with and this storytelling. Uh, did I answer your question about this? Uh, yeah, you did. And uh, you had a specific visual, uh, maybe art or something. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, different visualization tools exist, but uh, you can start with just Excel or like Google spreadsheet. So even like using these basic tools, you they have the uh, they have um, several options, many many options how you can visualize it, or bar charts or just lines or like any more different options. Oh, not, not so like it's something like animations or something. It's just simple. Yeah, just data. simple. Yeah, histogram for example. But uh, like knowing how to align it properly, how what numbers to put there, it's uh, already you what you what you. Uh, make your like, visualization better. And there are a lot of advice how to do it uh, in this book. Uh, you had uh, the question. Like, yeah, like, how do you guys like, really work on data doing something or efficiency or like practicing? So uh, data uh, I mean we have a lot of data about uh, about like riders, how many rides they did, what was like average Estimated time of arrival for the drivers, how many drivers were available in this time, in this place. Uh, I mean, but it's just like you have a lot of data and you just use it to build some models, uh, to build uh, analytics 